<laughs> All right. So excited to be here with you again, Mark. Um, really excited to talk about this subject. And maybe um, you could share a couple pages and I'll spotlight you here. Um, because my first question is basically, why should nature journalers seriously consider using ink as a tool? And maybe you could share some of your recent pages to give people kind of an idea of what you're up to with ink. Okay. Um, so first off, um, sorry for running late. I have the whole restarting thing. Uh, um, so why ink? Um, part of it is... I think I mean, there are a lot of arguments like uh, it's good for decisiveness and kind of uh, getting you to be uh, less fussy with the things that you're doing. Uh, one of uh, Marley's uh, October nature journaling prompts was to do like messy quick sketches of animals. Um, but it's definitely good for doing bad drawings quickly. You have uh, very little leeway to... Uh, fuss around and uh, edit. I just like, yeah, get it down, get it down, get it down. So you have the squiggle squirrel. Um, I think that? also it's, I think it's just kind of cool, depending on the mood you're going for, like especially if we're in a Halloween-y kind of zone um, for, you know, for October. Um, just having a pretext to add some blacks to things gives you a certain mood. Uh, there's a certain kind of like, bold, emphatic statement that you get from that, that uh, I guess a more delicate touch wouldn't necessarily provide. Um, it's also, I think, a way of pushing yourself a little bit to make strong value choices. Um, one of, yeah, uh, one of Marley's other prompts for this month was to do uh, landscape details with dark darks. Uh, this was fairly... Um, Ooh. Yeah, this this uh, was required a lot of concentration. Um, you've got to think really intensely about the uh, kind of what you're looking at and how you want to render it and how you're going to distinguish adjacent shapes from each other. I definitely felt like I mentioned this is kind of an Alex Toth look. He's uh, a kind of 20th century comic artist who did a lot of mm. really bold kind of a black and white design work in his comics. Um, with like big chunky brush strokes and so on. So I think this is definitely a way of committing to a, to play in both ends of the value pool at the same time. There is a tendency, depending on the medium we're using and depending on the maybe our mindset where we can easily end up pushing everything towards the middle making right. our darks lighter and our lights darker and kind of everything becomes these kind of infinitely tiny gradations of like a very, very subtle gray next to another very, very subtle gray and everything just kind of like, uh, kind of like mishes together in the mid range of the valley pool. So yeah. this is kind of a way of shoving these maximally far apart. I think those are my, Got it. Cool. I like the way it looks. I like the mood yeah. it creates, and I like that it forces me to think really hard sometimes about what I'm rendering. Just Great. So, yeah, I guess my next question then is, um, what are some of the most common mistakes that you see nature journalers uh, making when they're using ink tools? I mean, I guess mistakes is kind of a judgmental term, but you can interpret that how, how you want. Yeah, I mean... That kind of implies there's a right and a wrong way to use the tools, which I feel kind of philosophically uh, uncomfortable with. Um, just looking at the things that people have been posting just in the last couple of weeks in the uh, Facebook group uh, with their kind of ink experimentations and everybody's using the tools in a slightly different way that is great. I love the diversity of approaches. Um, so I'm gonna have to think very carefully here before I uh, put anything in a way that sounds at all prescriptive. I mean, as, having just said that I, I love doing the uh, dark accents, I mean, sometimes what you want to do is you want to go for like a, a more delicate kind of thing. I think a lot of people approach it like this, mm -hmm. or just using the ink line for like a, a contour, and mm -hmm. we're not using it to create texture. 
and we're not really using the ink to create value that's being done by the paint. And that's a very beautiful look that feels, it, it, it's nice for like horticultural illustration and botanical illustration among mm -hmm. other things. Uh, at the same time, I'll do something where it's like, okay, I'm going to go black on the wasp and then we're back to this very delicate kind of, mm -hmm. you know, just contour outline. So yeah. I would never say that it's a mistake not to put in spot blacks. It's like if you're mm -hmm. just using it for delicate, delicate lines, that's a beautiful thing. Um, so I think I'd have to look at myself and go, when do I have trouble? Um, so I... Um, Let's see. While I'm while I'm stalling, uh, one this is one I actually ran into trouble. This was a uh, one of your prompts to draw the darkest flower, and I'm like, well, I don't see a dark flower, but I see these dark leaves, and I was like, oh, this will be a good object lesson in how kind of like if you render your your textures and your values with the ink, then you can use a really light paint wash, and you don't have to choose your paint color mm -hmm. to create a dark value. But I completely goofed up the colors. I was feeling so smug about my nice ink drawing that I was like, and then I'll slap on any old paint. I'm like, no, you can't do that. The mm. ink is not going to kind of do all the work. You also have to be attentive to the colors you're putting on. This is my second pass. I'm like, okay, fine. I'm just going to kind of put in just the really black blacks, and then mm. I'll actually try and color match. So one hazard I get is I get so into my ink work, but I'm then indifferent about the paint. I think if you're gonna put on paint, the paint has to be has to be good, has to be right. That's something which a lot of other people, I think, are really attentive to in the nature journaling, and I'm not. So that's a shortcoming mm -hmm. on my part, is I underestimate that your paint color still has to be, you know, either that or just work purely in black and white and don't worry about it. But um, So that's the thing that I berate myself for, Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Another thing, I think, um, I I think it's fine to have multiple passes at a line where you can go, eh, not quite, not quite. Maybe you take like your know, one or two goes. You don't want to overwork things. Uh, you don't want to go over this. You don't want to go over the same line multiple times and just grind it in. If you're going to put down like a second pass of the line, it should be, I think, markedly different from the first one you put down. So, um, but a lot of the time it's helpful to close up your lines um, rather than having a bunch of disconnected lines floating around. I think it's nice to join them up and kind of, you know, so things overlap fully. That's maybe something that'll be easier to demonstrate. I can rig up the document cam and do some bad ink drawings or problem ink drawings. Yeah, definitely. So um, uh, before doing that, though, I guess um, one other question that I wanted to ask you was, you know, um, what are some of, and maybe this is putting it the same question in sort of more of a positive spin is, you know, what are some of your top tips for nature journalers who are trying to improve their, their use of ink, or maybe are incorporating ink um, for the first time? Okay, this is an this is an actual considered bit of advice. So I I, I did think about something for this. Okay, it, great. It, I think it's it may be helpful going in to have an idea about the role you're expecting ink to play in the picture mm. that you're making. Um, let me see. Just for the sake of argument, let me see if I can actually do a screen share with the document cam. I think this is something that will be a little easy, more easily shown. Yeah. Than blabbed yeah. about. So um, I've got my document camera here, firing Great. it up, and let's see if I can just overhead it here. Yeah. While you're setting that up, I'm just gonna check out the chat over here and say yeah. hi to people that I see um, commenting in the chat. There's a bunch of people watching. Looks like at least 31 people watching. So if you're not commenting in the chat go ahead and, and say something in there i see um alexandra is here jose jimenez is here from patagonia lisa is here debbie and yet uh two debbies alexandra kate rudder is here terry's here suzanne eli and jean 
Eli. Uh, thank you for joining in. Talia is here. I just met Eli for the first time pretty recently. So that was that was a thrill. It's nice, for, nice. to be getting back into the zone of starting to do things in person again. Yes. Um, all right. So I think if I do a share, let's see. Hmm. Can I share a single window? Um, you should be able to, when you click on share, you should be able to um, go up to, there should be an option when you put share screen um, to say select window or screen. Do you see that one? Ah, yes, I do. All right, cool. Okay, so. Okay, I think I still have to add it to the stream though. So here, let me add that. All right, so here's like an overheady thing. Um, let me grab a drawable prop. Okay, so here's my little muskrat skull. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Yeah. You know, I've got a raccoon skull. It's a little bigger that might make better use of the screen space. These are my two skulls. There we go. That's that's bring in bandit. All right, so here yeah, the raccoon skull doesn't look like much from above, but uh, we can probably put this at a rakish angle. And uh, then what I'll do is I'm just going to draw what I see on the screen. So I'll be seeing the same thing you're all seeing. All right, so there's my hand, my, my big fleshy hand. Um, so what do we want our ink to do in this production? So there's at least uh, three roles that I think we can imagine this uh, this medium playing here. One is simply to kind of hold. This is extremely weird. I'm watching my hand on the screen. Yeah, I, so I do that sometimes too. This is this is a new thing for me. This may be a terrible drawing, or it may be like a really good. No, there's a lag. The lag is throwing me. Um, oh. Okay, this is going to be a weird experience. Um, it's kind of like a blind contour drawing. It really is. I just need to approach it in that vein. This is going to be a new experience. I'm not going to look at my hand. I'm just going to look at the screen. It's a little bit laggy, but um, this does make it kind of more of a blind contour kind of experience. So uh, I think part of the fun of doing kind of your ink-themed adventure in October is the Halloween season. It's kind of a time to play with your fears a little bit. Mm. You're kind of thinking about things that are kind of distressing, like mortality and darkness and the sun going away, never ever to return and all the leaves falling off the trees. And so it's kind of gives us maybe a framework to, uh, to turn some of those things into a little bit of a game. So I think uh, for people who aren't so used to working in ink, it's maybe a good time to go, uh, you know, it's just a game. It can't really hurt me. So this is a little bit of a game for me as well. I'm trying something extremely new and weird, kind of like uh, uh, the first Wild Wonder way back when. when we had uh, Claire Walker Leslie did a keynote speech in which she was having people do always kind of weird like your blind contour drawing exercises yeah but, you know, i was just here to like you know just sit in the darkness and let my bottom grow numb and like listen to an inspirational talk i wasn't expecting to work but being clever yeah. probably, she's like get out your sketchbooks now do this do that all right i'm rambling this happens when i'm drawing all right so right now i've got a rough outline I couldn't resist putting some little ticky marks in here, but uh, um, from here, we could just end the ink phase here. This is just going to be our outline that uh, we're going to fill with your know, paint or right. pencil or any old thing. Um, so I'm going to maybe kind of divide this into three segments that I'll kind of render in different ways. Um, actually, I could almost say that's like four different approaches. Yeah, okay. Um, so let's say approach number one is a line only. Okay. Plus paint or whatever. 
All right, we can uh, use ink to create values. This is one of the fun things about drawing bones in particular is because uh, they don't have, they're pretty light in value. Uh, we can either just kind of treat the stuff around them as being kind of the uh, dark element and leave the bones kind of right. completely spared out. Or we can actually kind of you know, make a decision. We're going to push the uh, the value pattern a little further, kind of um, darken it up a little bit. So we could start making choices about how, I don't know, maybe the uh, this kind of, well, what seems like the darkest thing here, maybe the dark recesses. So we can kind of go, okay, I'm going to maybe add some shading in here, maybe start from the darkest visible parts and start darkening them up. Uh, right now, I'm just, these kind of parallel lines, what we call hatching lines. Um, they don't have a particular direction to them. If you make them pretty even and consistent, then they won't create distracting detail. Um, we can also cross hatch them, which is where you kind of make something a little darker by doing a second set of lines at a different angle. That's kind of a fairly classic approach. Um, and then we go, okay, what are some other things that aren't quite as dark as that? Another thing that's very popular, and you see this a lot in kind of uh, historical illustration, nature nature illustration, and homical illustration is stippling, right? Which is our kind of little cluster of the dots, dot, dot, right. dot, 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 dot. Um, this is, it's time consuming, but it's kind of meditative if you're into that sort of thing. And it does enable us to get some really subtle kind of value transitions. The trick with this is not to just kind of end up making everything the same kind of density of dots. You really want to hold back and not put dots all over everything or it's going to turn gray. So we need, as we're doing this, not to just kind of get so lost in our little dot adventure that we forget to kind of manage our values a little bit. So there need right. to be places with no dots and there need to be places with a lighter density of dots. And in the way of things, we can always add more dots, but it's very hard to take them away again. Um, so yeah, that's so would you consider um, the hatching like number two? Would that still be under your, under your sort of schema there of uh, one being line using the ink for line only and two being using the ink for value? Would would uh, would that be uh, OK? There we go. Yeah, it's uh, a good question. I would think of these all as um, um, stickle dots. Um, there's also kind of things we can do like, you know, we can do an ink wash. We can take our ink and dilute it. Right. Um, and kind of start painting in gray. That's kind of basically just painting at that point. Right. Um, but it's still a thing. So we've got a couple of questions here from the audience. Yeah. Um, let's answer. Um, well, Greg Gilson is asking, which pin are you using? I see it's a micron, but maybe uh, you could let us know which number it's micron. A micron. 08, which is pretty chunky. Um, I have no sense of subtlety, so I always use like a giant thick micron. I know some people prefer the uh, much thinner ones or epitographs or whatever. Okay. And that's probably mean that's I think honestly that's probably a sign of moral superiority <laughs> to you is to use a fine pen. I think of this as being one of my many uh one of my many ethical failings is I just <laughs> go in and chunk stuff up. All right, then this next question is from Kate Rudder, and it is, um, what tips do you have for distinguishing value um, tone slash shadow from local color? You know, this is, that's a really good question that I want to kind of tackle on a different page because I have some examples of that that I can talk about. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, I think I tend to think about, I t think a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot about local value. Um, that before we even talk about color, things are intrinsically lighter or darker. You know, my my skin is lighter in value than my hair or my shirt or the inside of my mouth 
or the irises of my eyes or the frames of my glasses. And so I'm going to put more ink on things that I'm thinking of as dark and try and restrain myself from putting down a lot of ink on things that are light in value. Um, so I, ideally, we can do a lot of our value decisions in the realm of ink before we even kind of get into putting paint on top. I think that's kind of where I was going that. Okay. The other thing that we can use ink for, and these aren't mutually exclusive, is when we put down the lines, we can also use them to describe, uh, or when we make marks on the page, we can use them to describe texture and contour. We can kind of sculpt these hatching lines so they kind of roll over the form. Uh, this would be what we call a cross contour line, which is something that kind of moves over the surface of the object. So we can kind of sculpt these a little bit and have them kind of follow the curvature of the form. I love doing this at this point. This is kind of my default mode of putting down lines and in ink is to kind of march them over the surface of the object and wrap them around the form. Um, so when we're doing this, these marks that we make are both creating value and they're also describing form. So it's like a twofer. Um, I would much more I'm much more likely to curve or sculpt my uh, hatching lines. Um, we can, on if we're drawing a planar object, which you don't have so much of in nature, then um, maybe those lines just move straight. So if we have like a cube, uh, mm -hmm. they're still going to move straight across the surface. This could actually be like a kind of a wooden block, but uh, if we want to. Um, but uh, usually on organic objects, they're going to be kind of curvy. We can kind of change the appearance of this a little bit. We could make our skull look edgier by not just drawing with like choppy straight lines, but by even making our hatching lines maybe a little more kind of angular and mm. regular and kind of cluster them into these little bursts of straight lines and kind of sculpt it that way. And that's going to give us maybe a slightly more kind of... Uh, brutish and angular appearance of the skull if we deliberately don't curve them so much but just make these little kind of clusters of lines that are maybe i'm you can see i'm kind of like starting a whole new skull here at this point it's a danger um so yeah if we put these together in kind of little angular groups we get a more angular object if we curve them gently we're going to get a more subtle object I kind of think of this as being maybe uh, there's a golden age illustrator named Franklin Booth who did a lot of this kind of uh, fairly stiff hatching lines in his illustrations. So we can do that kind of thing and get maybe a more, I guess I can think of maybe a more masculine kind of approach where they're kind of are flowing curvy lines, maybe a little more an Art Nouveau or something. Mm -hmm. Um but that's kind of the thing is uh, ink lines have personality. That's another reason for why this is a fun tool is uh, you're kind of putting a little bit of uh, expression into the marks that you make, which uh, otherwise can be, there are ways to achieve that with other media, but there's a particular way in which an ink drawing has a personality. Um, so yeah, and I mentioned texture as well. That's not just in the sense that, uh, say, if you're rendering a block of wood, uh, you can draw in a kind of wood grain that kind of follows this, that kind of replicates the uh, pattern you're seeing. Um, that creates a value and it creates a texture. But even if you have something where it's like, say, this is rough on the side, like it's been roughly sanded, we can do like little choppy short lines, bam, 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 and kind of try and evoke the texture of the thing we're seeing in the marks that we make. If we're drawing something with long fur, we draw long lines. If we're drawing something with short fur, we draw like your short fuzzy lines and so forth. Um, so yeah, our ink marks can describe the texture and they can kind of follow the contours of the object and make it a bit more three-dimensional. And then of course, we can always just design purely with blacks and so on. That's another 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 thing great so um in terms of what tools you use um and sort of nature journaling um in the field versus in the studio what kinds of what kinds of 
um, considerations are there when taking ink into the field? Um, could you could you talk about that at all? I feel like there's certain media that people are feel comfortable with using in their home studio, and then when it comes to going nature journaling in the field, then they suddenly um, shift. Could you talk a little bit about that or your what kit you use? Yeah. Um, your kind of first goal is always going to be kind of portability, I think, in the field. Uh, I definitely want to use waterproof ink. Drawing with water-soluble ink is a whole different thing that scares me. <laughs> um, so I've got... Uh, I would typically bring, like, uh, waterproof felt pens. Uh, Felt-tip pens. Um, I like my microns. Um these kind of big old sign pens, these are kind of uh, bigger, more slightly brushier felt tips. Uh, it's also known as like the Zebra Zensations brush pen, whatever. Um, brush pen, sign pen. Those are great for doing dark accents and for like making big chunky brush strokes. Usually there'll come a time when I'm working on a drawing where I'm like, okay, it's time to add some spot blacks. And this guy comes out and never goes back again because... It's intoxicating at a certain point. This just becomes the way we're doing things now. Definitely. Um, and then it's you want to be careful with corrections. I love the uh, liquid paper pen, um, which is a great way to kind of just draw white on top of black, but it's got a lot of resist to it. Um, why am I doing this? What am I trying to do here? I'm trying to do maybe a spider web, I've decided suddenly, just because, you know, Halloween-ish, right? Um, but you can't paint on top of it, so that kind of has to be the final step. You want to think carefully about where you put it. Your know, kind of gel pen is like maybe a little bit more forgiving. Uh, it can take a bit of a uh, bit of paint on top of it. So um, it's nice to have something that you can use uh, a white tool. You can use both for corrections and also for drawing white on black, which is often like super fun and appropriate for the situation. Um, I would say our kind of full on brush pen. Uh, this is the uh, Pentel color brush. You also make one called the pocket brush. Uh, yeah. It's fun to bring into the field. Again, once this comes out, it doesn't go away again because then you're like, this is what we're doing now. It's intoxicating. Um, this is kind of much more of a uh, kind of full-on comic book style brush. I think this is a brand that the uh, Korean illustrator Kim Jong-gi uses for all his live demo drawing. Right. It's a tremendous range of thicknesses. It's like super fun and awesome. With the slightest adjustment of pressure, you can go from kind of full strength to uh, very delicate. Um, and it's got its own self-contained ink supply. The one thing I think you want to be careful with this is uh, you want to check that it's not going to soak through the pages of your sketchbook. And that okay. one also is dangerous if you if you change altitude. I've found uh, I've uh, several times um, brought that one on planes and then opened it up at location and then had huge inks. Oh, yeah. all over my paper. Um, oh, I just yeah. put the link to that one. Um, I've looked it up as the Pintel Pigment Brush Pen because um, they do have one that is water soluble as well. And I posted yeah. the names of all of these um, tools that um, that you've mentioned here for people yeah. in the comments there. So I think the uh, the waterproof pigment ink has like a gray barrel. That's um, yeah, exactly. Gray. And the water soluble, yeah. the water ink has a black barrel. So that's kind of the uh, the difference there. Yeah. Um, beyond that, you get into things which maybe aren't quite as portable. Um, you could try though. Your classic kind of comic book inking tools are going to be like a quill pen and or a brush, both of which are going to require like their own kind of ink supply. Right. I actually just picked up this. Um, doo -doo -doo. Yeah, this beautiful book uh, during a recent trip to Michigan. Um, I'm going to, I picked this up, Backgrounds of California by mm -hmm. Earl Follander. And these are these beautiful little road trip wow. drawings he did. 
and these were done with a bamboo pen wow. um, and like some and he had like some full strength ink and then some diluted ink uh, that he used for the gray tones. It's like, wow, that's fantastic. Um, so I was so inspired by this. Again, Back Roads of California by uh, Earl Follander. Um, so I, I got a bamboo pen, which I'm still getting the hang of. For some reason, my bamboo pen drawings don't look as pretty as, as, as Earl's do. Mm -hmm. um, but this is one of those things that's going to need like a separate ink supply. And this yeah. raises the possibility of spills and cleanup and things like that. But uh, so it's like any kind of like paint medium is that we get to, into the zone of uh, how much kit is going to be required here. Mm. Um, how much cleanup is going to be involved? What's the worst that could happen when I'm moving this stuff back and forth? Um, some people, uh, I think, uh, think... I don't know if Laurie Wickham started this, but I'm, I'm think, uh, I think Kate's done some of it, uh, where you just kind of like draw using a twig that you find on scene. Yeah. So that's kind of a variation on the bamboo pen concept. And that seems like a grand old time. And certainly uh, there's a kind of neat gyotaku potato stamping kind of thing to that, where it's like you're making an image of the thing using the thing itself. So yeah, um, I did a video. I did a video about that where I went in nature journal a tree using ink and a stick from that tree. Yeah, so that's something I haven't really played with. I certainly I haven't played with it very much, and I've never tried taking it on location. So yeah. I don't see why you couldn't. Right, right. So. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks for sh sharing that part. Um, I have a couple more questions here and some little um, practice round things that we can do. Um, but first, let's answer this question. Um, there are a couple questions here. Let's see. Um, Alexandra is asking, um, oops, this is the, I was meant to click on this one. What's the difference between using a bamboo pin and a metal pin nib? I think Greg was asking that question mm. as well. Yeah, I think one thing that a metal nib has is uh, it's got a little ink reservoir. Um, let me try and position this. Maybe right in front of my face so you can kind of, uh, for contrast, there we go. Yeah, there's a little kind of hole in the tip right about here. Um, which that's not showing it at all well. Maybe I'll go back to screen share for this, uh, which holds the ink. So I find I don't have to dip it as frequently. I think it may be just that this bamboo pen isn't very conditioned, but I find I have to dip it constantly. Um, so the metal quill pen can hold more ink, I think, I find. Um, it's... I think that's the main thing. Maybe you've got a little bit more kind of pressure sensitivity because the tip of a quill pen is designed so the kind of prongs spread apart if you apply pressure. Right. So you kind of go from something where you've got a bubble of ink sitting up here and then these two tines and the ink bleeds down between them and leaves a thin line. If you push harder, it kind of forces the tines apart a little bit. The line gets thicker. So you've got a lot of kind of... Um, you can adjust the line thickness uh, based on kind of the amount of pressure you apply. Whereas I think the the bamboo pen is probably going to be a bit more random. Uh, it may go thick to thin kind of a bit more spontaneously. And uh, maybe that's nicer for a natural subject, I think. Got it. Okay, cool. Um, are you ready to do a little uh, application of this with some uh, images that I have to test? Sure. Them? Yeah, okay, cool. Cool. maybe we can get people in the audience to vote. We have two um, short video clips here that we're going to nature journal using ink from. Um, so vote if you would prefer a fish or a scorpion. Um, fish or scorpion. <laughs> um, vote in the uh, comments there, fish or scorpion. A scorpion fish. Uh, it's not a scorpion fish. I think it's a trigger fish. Oh, cool. Hopefully people will vote soon. And then after that, we're going to do, we have, I have a landscape photo 
Um, I see two fish votes, one scorpion, uh, scorpion fish, 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 um, scorpion, scorpion. Jeez, it's a close, this is a close, close call here. Fish. Okay, I think we're gonna have to go with the fish. It seems like we got more votes on the fish. Um, oh, more people just voting on the scorpion. But okay, we're gonna go with this one. Do arthropods? Do arthropods? <laughs> I know the arthropods are easy to draw with ink, though. So oh, they're very they're very ink friendly. They're an inky subject. Oh, more more votes on the scorpion. Um, let's see. Am I actually gonna be to someone saying to do both of them? Okay, yeah, let's start with this one. So what we're going to do is pretend like this is something we were seeing in real life. And how would we uh, nature, ooh, how would we nature journal this? It's a really short video, so I'll have to replay it a couple times. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually at the Baltimore Aquarium. People who follow my Instagram maybe have seen this already. If you're if you're at home, go ahead and uh, uh, nature journal this as well. Um, I'm going to set up mine so you can see my drawing as I go, hopefully. If you are at home, now is your chance to nature journal as well. Oh, I love that little paddling pectoral fin. It's just so cool. Okay. So do we have like some kind of time countdown here, Marley? Or uh, I probably should have put a time limit on it, but let's just maybe do like a, uh, I don't know, five minutes or uh, okay. 10 minutes or so. Okay. I probably should have used a different ink tool for that part, but well. It's such a weird fish. I did try nature journaling this when I was there at the aquarium and it was quite weird. Oh. Maybe I should have done this in a separate one. So I kind of did an initial sketch with the mindset that if I was just there kind of witnessing this live, I would be able to get an uncertain amount and then have to stop. The fact that it's looping means I can kind of go back and kind of continue elaborating on right. it. But I'm trying not to do that too much. I want to maybe kind of keep some of the feeling of uh, a loose sketch here. But uh, yeah, I think water and reflections in water are a fun thing to tackle with ink because uh, I think it rewards that tendency to kind of be big and bold and stark. Uh-huh. So let me, I'm just going to yeah, kind that's of. that's one thing I'm trying to get better at. So what I'm kind of doing here at this point is I had like a little kind of quick doodle, as it were. And then I kind of went in and just started putting in black for the water um, with the brush pen, which is kind of fun and satisfying. And I think from there I might get out a white pen and just kind of draw in those kind of noodly are those is that some kind of coral? I think it's either a, a coral or a fake coral, perhaps in the in this tank. Yeah, I mean, Lord knows there's a billion kinds of coral, and they can look like anything. So, coral is this whole weird world. What is that? There's a term for that. A cnidarians, right? That encompasses jellies and corals and so forth. Um, I'm not super good on my marine invertebrates, so I'm not totally sure. 
Oh, there's another fish down there in the corner. It just there kind is, of, yeah, and it, it's I hidden mean, by the button, but it, I think it's actually a really cool puffer fish. Oh, um, no, I want to draw that one. I know, right? It barely, I don't think I'll be able to get it in there. I thought it was really funny the way the hand came down and it looked like some kind of weird puppet show because of the, the light, you couldn't see the, the person. You could just see the disembodied hand. <laughs> yeah, it's like one of those, uh, in, in, in Prague, they have like that tradition of the black light theater. Oh, where people are asking if you can um, share your screen. I could. Is that going to kind of disrupt people's view of the uh, fishitude, though? Um, it might, because the way that I share my screen does uh, is just switching the camera. And I think on yours, it's it's not switching the camera. It's used as a share screen. So, um, Eli, I think, and others, I think we're going to have to wait, and he'll share. He'll be. Able to share. I'll, I'll just hold this up and, instead, of, okay. instead of my face. So this yeah. is kind of what I'm doing um, here. I just added in the uh, coral. I did that with the whiteout pen. Um, I figure I don't have to draw it exactly where I'm seeing it because it's sort of an arbitrary thing. I think from here, uh, I'm draw I'm working here based on what I'm seeing on the screen, which is mirror imaged. I might go in and close up some of these gaps here. So it's kind of like, okay, and then this way, no, other way, other way. There we go. Yeah. All right. So I might fill in some of these gaps to make for a cleaner silhouette. That's kind of a relation related to that whole thing of like closing up the lines that I mentioned bafflingly earlier. Nice. Okay, cool. The awesome. one other thing I might add here mm -hmm. is within my original sketch, and it went away when I inked over it, is I had this little kind of motion lines, bloop, 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 to kind of show the, uh, the, the, the lips nibbling. I think that's Ooh. fun. I'm going to put it back in with a gel pen. <laughs> great, great. Motion lines. I'm going to, I'm going to copy you on that one. Um, and let's see. Why is it not showing the fish anymore? There we go. Okay, cool. So let's just do a, a couple more minutes here on this one or a, a minute and then switch to the scorpion because it sounded like people definitely want that. <laughs> so drawing fish in ink is a whole other kind of challenge dimension. Um, there are some things about it that's similar to drawing moving mammals and some things that are a little different. Um, a lot of the time with mammals, there's kind of a couple of gestural lines uh, that are kind of important to get down quickly. And then you can kind of continue fleshing out the whole creature based off of that. So, da, da, da. so yeah, um, when I'm drawing fish, um, I try and get the overall shape pretty quickly and then kind of just build out the details. Oh, I know where that is. <laughs> yeah, it, it's pretty it's pretty familiar. Um, requires a lot of concentration, though, because you've got to get the proportions right. Um, fish are maybe a little tricky because they are kind of one big shape. And if you sketch out that big shape and then start building the details into it, if the original shape is wrong, you're basically, ugh, you're just going to have a bad drawing. Um, so it requires a lot of concentration. And I think on this day, I got to the point where I got tired and my proportioning started going. So I go, okay, I'm going to rough that out. No, that's not quite right. This fish is too long. This one's too short. Uh, I have a bad drawing. I can't really save no matter how long I work at it. You know, with a mammal, I think the proportions are more familiar and right. they're made up of smaller shapes. A fish is one big shape. And if you foul that up, gonna be a bad fish day all right well let's go straight to the scorpion then are you ready for that okay cool you okay yeah. oops oh okay. hello oh look at his little eyes 
<laughs> I think this one might actually be a gravid female. Wow. I was trying to see if it would be defensive, and it was not defensive at all. So leave me alone. <laughs> exactly, right? Okay. All right, everybody at home, I highly encourage you to try to uh, nature journal along or at least sketch along a little bit using whatever ink tools you have at home. Okay. Get back to sort of the um, pause it somewhere more in between where it can see the whole thing. Now, so this kind of becomes a question, I suppose, as to are we drawing one particular scene or are we trying to document the experience in right. color form? And we could do either or both. And I think I'll probably do an example of each of those approaches, okay. which hopefully will explain kind of what I mean. Um, so first, I'm just going to kind of sketch this uh, pose we have here, which kind of shows the whole thing. We got that. I love how arthropods just all the parts fit together so perfectly. They're exquisitely machined. Like whoever designed this thing, it's like, ah. Oh. Yeah, I love drawing arthropods as well for that same reason. And yeah, they are made up of modules, which makes it a little easier to do your kind of proportioning, I think. Um, it's not just one big shape that you've got to nail. It's a bunch of smaller shapes that you can kind of fumble your way through if you have to. And certainly with uh, the more you draw these kinds of guys, the more you get used to their construction and go, okay, here's this leg, here's this leg. I can't see it, but I know this attaches here and it should come out at this point. So there's definitely a kind of building up a familiarity with their body structure becomes helpful over time. Personally, I like to draw something first and then research the anatomy because um, then I care. So my mm -hmm. first time drawing something, I'm generally flying blind. I'm like, what is this? I have no idea what this is. What's that doing? What's that thing? What does that connect to? And then I do the homework and then I come back to it next time and I know a little more about it. So this is my kind of uh, yeah, quick sketch thus far. I think the next step for this, if I'm doing this as a render drawing, is going to be to start putting in some spot blacks. I think that would be nice. I think that would be in the spirit of the thing. Uh, so now the picture's gone. Yeah, hold on. Uh, whoops, shoot. Um, takes a second here to add it back in. For sure. There we go. Yeah. So whoops. this is definitely a thing where just putting in some like uh, black areas is going to be groovy. It'll add some visual punch, make it a little easier to separate the forms. And we're also kind of capturing some of the uh, local... I mentioned, I threatened I was going to elaborate on that notion of local value. Yeah. Um, the notion that us uh, overall, this scorpion is fairly dark in value, and therefore I'm going to go in pretty heavy with my ink. I'm not going to be shy about putting marks on its body. Um, if this were I don't know, say, um, a swan, I'd want to use a very light touch because if I do a whole bunch of ink rendering on it, it's going to turn into a goose pretty quickly. It's going to darken up. Yeah. So this this beautiful lady being intrinsically dark, I don't need to be terribly shy about um, slapping down ink. And so, so how do people do that without, like, making everything totally because i feel like that's something i'm always afraid of is it, i feel comfortable drawing the outline but like now going in and kind of putting in these blacks i'm afraid that i'm just going to lose the 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 shapes you know yeah um two things one is there is a kind of art school trick where you kind of squint at something until it just turns into a, a pattern of lights and darks mm -hmm. you kind of hide all the detail and that's a pretty good way of gauging like where things are lighter or darker 
Uh, it's also helpful to maybe periodically step back from your drawing and maybe kind of like compare it to the thing you're looking at and go, does that seem about right or have I, is there something, is there some obvious error I've made here as far as ascribing things to a light or dark? Um, there was another thing I was going to say. Um, let me regroup. Um, so, so how do you reserve the when you do yeah. that? How do you reserve the lights? Do you do you do you start drawing around them first, or do you build up from the darkest mm. places first? I would start by putting down my pattern, my my big black areas. What I'm kind of doing here is I start off by going, okay, what do I know unequivocally is black? Um. So I think that I was kind of doing that with my raccoon skull as well. It's like, okay, what's the darkest dark? Let's put down the things that are black and then sit back and think about what to do next. Got it. Um, okay. So if you were drawing on tone paper, I guess you're kind of drawing from the middle out to both ends of the value scale. If you're drawing on white paper, you kind of, uh, you're kind of drawing, I think generally you're drawing from one extreme towards the other. The other thing is you kind of want to make sure that you're separating things. Say, for example, um, yeah. the side of the tail, the plane of the, the side plane of the tail that's turned away from us is mm -hmm. dark. It also casts a shadow onto the back of the scorpion uh, that it's dark. Right. Yeah. So there's a danger if we think about this in kind of the purest diagram form. There is the shape of the scorpion tail, and there is a scorpion back. So uh, we have the tail here and the back here. So there is a dark side plane on that tail. There is a shadow on the back of the scorpion the tail is casting. If we merge those together into a single dark form, we're going to maybe lose some of our precious three-dimensional form. So there are various things we can do. One is to just kind of spare out a little white line between those to maintain that separation, uh, which I've added in here with my gel pen. I drew a little white line between the dark side plane, the tail, and the dark shadow it's casting on the scorpion's back. So even if those are both things that are dark, we may need to edit them for the sake of a clear drawing. Right. Um, or we can go, well, which of those two is darker? If I have two forms that touch and I don't want them to blend together, I may need to look at that and go, okay, only one of you can be a black. Who's it going to be? And the other one has to like settle for some kind of lesser value gradation. So at that point, we're making value decisions on the fly purely in order to separate shapes, which is the same thing I was doing with my landscape pitos. I'm like... Eh, you both look dark, but if I draw you both with black, if I'm going to lose the form. So, any meeny miny mo, you're black, you're not. When we involve um, gray tones or washes or whatever, it gives us additional options. We have a kind of compromise step. It's kind of a fun exercise to draw with three values the white of the paper, the black of the ink, and like a mid tone which is what uh, Earl Tholander was doing with his location drawings. Um, that might be a good thing for the diluted ink or just bring along a Tombow or something mm -hmm. to be your kind of your middle value. So we can kind of you, br involve a gray. I'm actually going to do that. I'm going to do that with my with mine right now is use the Tombow and put the middle values in. Yeah. There's a third option at least, there's always, always so many options, um, which is we can create a bit of a gradation here. Here again, I'm thinking about the part where the scorpion's tail sits over its back. What I've done here is I've made some tapering feather lines. So the black of the shadow uh, transitions into mm. white as it approaches the side plane of the tail. This gives us maybe a little bit of the impression of some indirect light spilling into that shadow and lighting it up from the side. So I've got kind of a couple of options here. One is to just leave a white line to separate the, the black of the the black side plane, the tail from the shadow on the back. 
Another is to kind of render, uh, da, 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 yeah, render with feathering lines to create a sense of indirect light spilling through and starting to fill in that shadow. Or I could just say to heck with it. I'm going to merge those together. It's what I see. That's not wrong. It's going to be one black shape, and I don't. It's not my responsibility to unpack it for the viewer so this becomes a scorpion anatomy diagram. I'm going to draw black shapes and light shapes and maybe some gray shapes. And I'm not, this isn't an anatomy textbook. And that's also completely legit. I say, as the arbiter of what isn't, isn't legit. <laughs> so the other option you could have done, I suppose, in addition to kind of doing the uh, fancy drawing from a still, is to maybe do just like a little cartoon of what was happening there, which is right. typically the kind of scorpion lady being poked with a stick by some off-camera weirdo. <laughs> is, is there some reason, Marley, why both of these involve hu off-camera humans doing stuff? Oh, that's a good question. Well, I wasn't, I wish I was the person feeding that fish, but I wasn't, um, I, I was the person messing with the scorpion, but, um, no, that wasn't intentional. But, uh, I think sometimes in our nature journaling, we, we don't include the human, the humans that are in, uh, in part of the environment or definitely influencing it. So I think it's, it's good to include them. Like I try to often include myself on my page. I know that you also include yourself I think you said parachute yourself into your pages <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. So I try to parachute in um, when I can. It's, I think in a way, again, I, I've kind of got the Halloween thing on the mind. So it's almost like a, a kind of horror story from the animal's perspective where these there are these incomprehensible alien beings that operate on a scale we can't begin to imagine. And sometimes they're kind of, you know, Sometimes they're giving you things and sometimes they seem threatening and sometimes you can't figure out what the heck they're even doing. They're just staring at you and like, you know, making marks on a, on a, on a piece of paper with an implement. Yeah. You know, human stuff. So I think we're kind of weird. We may sometimes come off as like weird, incomprehensible elder gods or something from the uh, bug perspective. Yeah, I think one of the points I was trying to make with the scorpion is that people are often really afraid of them. Um, and at least this species in Northern California, from my experience, is very, uh, they're not very aggressive. So even when I was intentionally trying to get it, um, you know, to, tr to use its stinger, it did not use its stinger. Yeah. So this is kind of the other option is to maybe draw a little non-representative cartoon of what's going on here. I think it's helpful to maybe start by doing a kind of a study of your subject. So you get, okay, we've got the little head end with the claws and, you know, the big bedonka donk and then the uh, curvy hose of the tail. But uh, after we've kind of familiarized ourselves with it a bit, we can do like a little kind of cartoon of what was going on where or, or we can kind of draw our kind of little scorpion hiding So even something like that. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, Great. my little cartoon scorpion, go away. <laughs> nice, nice. So, yeah, I think if I look at my body of drawings, there's going to be a combination of those things. There's going to be times when I'm kind of telling the story and times when I'm studying the critter and I can kind of cut back and forth. Uh, let's see if I can, I know we have like one more challenge in, in the wings here. It's going to be a landscape challenge. Um, I think uh, we're just going to have to do that one another time because we're, we're running out of time tonight. Um, but go ahead and share what you're going to share from your pages. And then I have a couple other questions that I wanted to ask you. Okay. Um, so yeah, Maybe just something like uh, this. I, this was a period in time when I was very intrigued by fish fins and kind of how they use them. 
Yeah. Um, so I was doing these kind of like more detailed studies of individual fish. And I'm like, okay, I just want to do like a little caricature of like the thing where like suddenly they pop out a bunch of fins at once. Poof. Yeah. So we have kind of these slightly more realistic fish over here. That's kind of more of a study. And then they're kind of getting a bit more cartoony down here and even more cartoony. And they could turn eventually into fish equivalent to stick figures. Mm-hmm. And, and I feel like that's a good parachuting self in, into the picture. And so we can have a mix of things. We can shift back and forth between kind of cartoon mode, representative mode, you know, goofy editorializing mode, diagram mode. Absolutely. Nice. Okay. So my last question is, um, you know, if people want to practice be besides sort of actually using these tools and practicing them, do you have any recommendations for how to learn from other artists? So like if, if people are looking at, you know, artists and who are using ink and they're like, wow, this person, um, you know, this illustrator or this comics artist, um, you know, like Bill Watterson, I love how he draws trees, for example, um, in Calvin and Hobbes. And so like, how would I, if I wanted to practice that, how can we learn from some other artists and how they use ink? I think my main advice on that is to do it in small doses because the world is full of artists making beautiful drawings all the time, all day long. There's 7 billion people on earth and a certain fraction of them are right now making a pretty picture. So it can be overwhelming and daunting and dispiriting to just sit there trawling through gallery upon gallery of beautiful work. And then you see another artist who's in a totally different style, doing totally different incompatible, incompatible things and go, oh, but that's also cool. Oh, I don't know which to do. I don't know what to do. And then there's this person over here and oh my God, I could just, why don't I just lie here and watch Netflix? So I think you don't want to barrage yourself with inspiration because at a certain point, I think it becomes counterproductive. Like when you spend like 10 hours in a museum, after a while, it's like, my brain's fried. I'm getting nothing out of this anymore. The inspiration I had has fled. So I think you want to maybe just seize on one thing one artist or maybe one aspect to an artist and go, okay, that, I'm going to hold that idea in my mind and then I'm going to go try it. So I might pull out the Earl Tholander book and look at this for a bit and go, okay, I love the way he does say trees and maybe do like a quick study of that and then hold that inspiration in my mind and go out and try it and not wonder and not fret about how he draws buildings or how Bill Watterson draws trees, which is also brilliant and totally different. So I think you just want to maybe pick just one thing to think about at a time and try that and kind of try and integrate it into what you're doing or try it and reject it or go, eh, hey, maybe another day. But don't overload on inspiration because there's so many different ways of doing things that are kind of cancel each other out. Yeah. And each artist has a battery of things they do that are awesome that can be overwhelming. So I think you just want to grab a little bit of inspiration and go try it. That'd be my advice. Got it. Great. Well, I'm really flattered that you're doing some of my Inktober prompts. <laughs> uh, for people who, who don't know about them, there's still a lot to go and you can find them. I think I went over them in one of my YouTube videos, but they're also um, on my website at marleypiper.com. And people are using this hashtag. Um, if you use social media and you want to share them on there. Um, it's a great way. I've been doing some of mine have been just 10 minutes in the evening, you know, mm -hmm. if you can't fit in a whole long session. Um, so really flattered that you're doing those, Mark. And I was really excited to get you, squeeze you in this month um, <laughs> to talk about ink. Um, and um, it's always really fun to talk with you. What do you, what do you have there that you're going to show us? Oh, I was going to show you uh, my Inktober stuff that I've done so far off your prompt list. I guess yeah. The term Inktober, it gets into this, this whole intellectual property thing that. Right, I have heard about yeah, that. I'm yeah, sure, I'm sure people have, have. I'm sure you've all heard as much about that as you want to hear about anything for the rest of our lives. All right. But my my uh, stuff, I did a gnarly tree. Ooh. And this is one of the things you can just lose yourself in. Um, this yeah. is definitely a case where the marks I make are following the form. I'm trying to replicate the texture and the contours. 
Um, and then I'm also attentive to how dark or light they're making things. So this is one of those things where the marks I make are serving multiple purposes. And then at a certain point, I'm just like, and the rest is going to be just silhouette shapes. I'm not going to try and render every branch in the background. I, I'd go mad. Um, and where do you end, especially with a gnarly tree like this that kind of sprawls out sideways? Like, how do I escape from this drawing I've started? Um, you can just hit the end of the page, and that puts a stopper on it, I suppose. Um, I talked about the, my, my leaf misadventures, and I sat on a tree stump and got sap all over my butt. And, <laughs> oh, and, that um, yeah, quick sketch invertebrate. That's kind of, yeah, obviously, uh, I, I, I would do that anyway. So it was a <laughs> short right one off the list. This is kind of fun because as I was drawing, I noticed it moved, um, kind of like the scorpion, where these, there's a gesture to arthropods. And this one, it's like, at first it was relaxed and spread out. And then as, I, as I'm as i looking at it and kind of getting close and maybe oh. breathing on it through my filter mask, it kind of you know, draws up its legs and starts to kind of like, yeah, I don't know, dude, what's going on here? Yeah. This is weird. Uh, this was super fun uh, doing the uh, landscape pitos all in like uh, high contrast. Yeah, oh, I, I love that. Um, I know this looks so cool and it was so mentally exhausting. I think I should, that's a sign that there's a muscle there I need to exercise a bit more. Uh, the messy sketch animals, these are really messy. I mean, this is not my, even for a messy sketch, this is not my, uh, my, my, my best work. I'm not proud of these, but I, I show them in the spirit of the thing. Um, and same thing with the uh, goose. And, uh, yeah, I think there was a skull thing in there. So I did yeah. some musk, uh, my muskrat skull. Right. Okay. Here. Uh oh some skull stuff and uh yeah this was just unrelated i was just drawing a lot of cicadas Ooh, nice bugs are a very inkable subject they tend to have a lot of high contrast they're kind of glossy yeah uh, they have some interesting textures i started getting into the little dimple texture of their the oh. of their uh their top surface which is a great to a great occasion for stippling because they are kind of dimply and stippled yeah so, now that's not an Inktober thing. That's just uh, okay. And uh, more skulls. It turns out uh, the this is a. Um, there used to be a lot more kinds of crocodile, um, crocodilians or crocodile forms or whatever you call them. Uh, uh -huh. They used to run around upright on four legs with their tails in the air, like you're know, sprinting back and forth. And apparently, I just found out this week, some of these survived into the mammal era. They survived the dinosaur extinction. This is wow. uh, Thebicus, which is a uh, essentially a wolf crocodile that uh, was running around like in the early uh, in the early Cenozoic era, chasing mammals. Um, and it's like, which is just the craziest weird thing to think about. And because it's a crocodilian, it's got this very dimply pitted texture, what's called a rugose yeah. texture on its skull that the uh, keratin adheres to. So they're super textured, and that's a lot of fun to do. You could just go spend ages drawing every little kind of furrow and valley in that in that skull and this nice. was one where i feel like uh yeah okay maybe this is this would be a little sad i drew a dead rat and i was like oh this is perfect for the occasion but at the same time it's like it's a bit sad and i don't think you can see that so, um, oh, well thanks for sharing all of those <laughs> It's awesome. It makes me want to go do like two more hours of uh, sketching instead of eating dinner. Um, well, thank you so much for your time and thanks everyone for joining. Uh, lots of people were posting here in the comments. I couldn't um, comment back to all of these people, especially on Facebook. Those comments weren't working. Loretta was here. Um, Cindy, Andrew, Talia, Suzanne, Jose was tuning in from um, Argentina. Terry, Greg, Alexandra, Ivea, Kate Rudder, Eli, Sequoia, 55PS. Anyways, a whole bunch of people were sending you love, Mark. So oh, thank you so much. I miss you all. Let's draw together. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everybody who tuned in. And for everyone who watches this as a recorded version, um, it's been fun. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Barley. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.